and they call action. And she goes to pull in the butt double. But the thing is, when you're pulling in someone, you want to pull in straight, right? But she pulled in like this. Now, <laughs> I swear I saw out this man's mouth. I, I, that was the coldest air he probably ever felt in his life. Welcome to Salon Talks. I am Mary Elizabeth Williams, and this gentleman next to me is Dylan Sprouse. He's an actor. He's an executive producer now, and an entrepreneur. So many that you're so many balls in the air. If you recognize him, it's maybe because you grew up with him or watched him grow up on, of course, The Sweet Life of Zach and Cody. But more recently, you may have seen him in the film series After We Collided, Beautiful Disaster, Beautiful Wedding. Beautiful Ooh. Wedding just came out earlier this year. And now he is in a brand new film, so much to talk about. It's called The Duel. Hi. Hello. All right, let's get started. Ooh. Let's get right into this. Let's with do it. The Duel. This yeah. is a movie about, um, as the tagline says, uh, modern problems and historic solutions. That's right. Tell me a little bit about the concept and the, the sort of crazy idea of this film. So the movie follows two best friends who gravely wrong each other. And one of them decides the only way to handle this is to challenge the other to an old timey duel to the death. And all the problems that arise from that idea. Um, and then there's some twists and turns along the way, um, which add to the chaos of the movie. It's a dark comedy. I made this quite a while ago now, three or four years ago with some of my best friends in the world. And we filmed this down in Indiana. And I'm very, very proud of this movie. It's the first one I've ever executive produced. Congratulations. That's a, that's a really big deal. Um, I saw the AMA that you guys did recently. Mm -hmm. um, and you were the one who said it was also sort of inspired by you and your co-star. That's, um, that's a, an interesting thing to throw out there. It's a provocative <laughs> thing. And I have to say, it left me with a thousand questions. So in what way... Are you and Callan? Yeah, none of the subject matter, okay. I should say, thankfully. Uh, but it was written by, so I worked on a movie called Banana Split years ago. Um, and my best friend in that movie was Luke Spencer Roberts, who is one of the two director writers of this movie. Um, and so when they were writing the two leads and their like characters and how their kind of personalities mash up, uh, Luke actually did, that he was inspired by both me and Callan. Callan's another very longtime friend of his. Um, and so in that way, and then, then we added all the trouble into that. Now, you said, as you say, you, you were working with friends on this production. You obviously, you grew up working with family. I would imagine that can be a double-edged sword. It can either be the best time of your life or kind of a hot mess. Maybe both. What is it like being on a production where you are so close and you know you have this long-standing relationship with and you're not just going to walk away when on the last day of shooting? Yeah, well, I would say, for me at least, I always think it's better to work with friends and family because I think that there's a shorthand um, towards taking and making creative risks too. Um, when you really know and trust people on set, I think everything comes easier. I know, you know, actors talk a lot about chemistry and stuff, but I think the backbone of good chemistry, whether you're acting angry or sad or happy or trying to make jokes, it's always made better if you're actually friends or like the people behind the scenes. Um, and having that not only with the cast, but also the crew in this particular scenario, I think it just really allowed us to kind of stretch our wings and make choices that uh, I think I'm proud to say I think panned out in this movie really well. This is a classic um, pistols at dawn kind of a, a premise. Um, a lot has changed in the time since you made this movie. Obviously, we now know about the um, difficulties of gun safety mm -hmm. on sets. We know what can happen because of what happened on Rust. I want to ask, when you're doing a movie like this, are you thinking about things like this? Like, how do we protect each other? How do we keep each other safe? There's a lot of, I mean, without, without giving the story away, it, if you say, if, the gun, if there's a gun on a mantle, as Chekhov would say, that gun's going to get fired at a certain point. No, I mean, it's a great point. And it's a, I think it's, it's 
very topical, of course. We, of course, had a, a good armor on set, as was required of us. Um, we were also dealing with like old flintlock pistols, though, right? Which is so, those are a little harder, I think, in general to uh, misfire or mess up with. Um, you really have to be particular about muzzle loading <laughs> a flintlock and making sure the flint is in place. And, um, and so I think in general, in terms of, I mean, guns aren't safe really in general, but in terms of as far as they go, flint locks are pretty safe on the end of, for shooting at least, a movie. Um, so, but yeah, that was always in the back of our minds, uh, as well as we shot this during COVID. So our safety precautions were pretty extreme in general. Um, this was right during the height of COVID. And so we did over a thousand tests over the period of a month and a half. And you know, the six feet rule and masks on set and all We were all above. quarantined together? The four main casts was quarantined together, which ended up becoming a little bit of a frat house. Um, but the four main boys were, were quarantined together. And I think that made the chemistry look more real. Yeah, there's the, the friendship and the dynamics between you, it's, it's very yeah. believable. And the heartbreak of that yeah. is very believable. This is, and speaking of the heartbreak, there is a moment in the film where someone says the words out loud, toxic masculinity. Mm -hmm. This is a movie that dances around these ideas of how men like to resolve their problems. That could not be more topical, even though it's kind of old fashioned solutions. Tell me a little bit about what that phrase means to you in your own life. And when you were coming into this character, what you brought with it from your own experience as a, as a man, as a husband, as a brother. Yeah, you know, the, the funny thing is I would also say for all of us on set, even the writer directors, I think we all have similar views on that subject matter. Um, and in our personal lives, I think for the movie, we wanted to frame it in a very uh, like morally gray area, right? We're neither a uh, dismaying it, we're neither, uh, we're neither pedestaling it, we're just presenting it as it is. Um, and that's been part of the fun of the screenings too, right? It's because people walk out of it and we're interested to hear groups of people arguing about what they think of the characters um, and the kind of lost causes and solutions or the exit ways they have along the way um, without spoiling anything. Um, but yeah, no, I think it's another incredibly topical thing in general. I've, I've grew up in a family with my father and my brother. My father's a very sensitive man though. And he, I think he was always good about making sure we were, we were not being assholes, pardon my French. Um, and so I think it's, it's more relevant than ever. I think the idea of honor is another thing that plays largely in this movie. And another subject matter, which I think is pretty topical too, uh, is conflict resolution and speaking to each other. That's a line that we say, no one talks to each other anymore. Um, and I think that we're presenting all of that in this movie in a way to, we're, we're hoping to hear fan reactions and audience reactions. That's been at least my favorite part of all of this. Although in some ways it's good conflict resolution because you do, without giving anything away, you do, you do come to a sort of mutually agreed upon paths there. I, I have been saying, even though this movie is a dark comedy, I have been calling it a love story about friendship because that's kind of what it is. In order to embark on a journey like dueling, you really have to love your friend and you have to be, you know, pretty remorseful about what you've done. So I think it's, it's first and foremost a love story about friendship. I love that. Uh, this movie, you're back in acting now. You took a break for a couple of years. You took a time to go to university. You got a degree in video game design. <laughs> yes. You um, are also an entrepreneur. You have been involved in um, mead. Uh, mead you, you had a yeah. mead making, and now you're a, in, in skier. Uh, yeah. You're, you're a, um, a co-founder of a skier business. Two questions for you. First, what are mead and skier? <laughs> um, and second, how did you get involved in the food and beverage industry? Um, I would say that that was kind of almost, not less so with mead, more so with skier. That was more of kind of like a falling into it. And especially with food and bev in general, I'm just a very strange man. Uh, I like like 
the things that I like, and I like supporting weird people. That is something that I love. All my friends are strange people too. Um, so I think with mead, I started brewing when I was really young, um, about 16. I learned that you could uh, buy the ingredients legally, but not buy the booze legally. My friends were very happy. Um, so I started brewing that, and then I just actually fell in love with the process of doing it. Um, and I like making things. I like cooking. I like brewing. I like uh, figure painting. I'm a nerdy guy. Um, but with Skier, I was traveling through Iceland, which is like one of my favorite places in the world. Um, and the buddy who was traveling with me at the time, his name is Unner, was bringing me to all these Skier bars, which seemed pretty cool out there. There were these like yogurt concept bars, and you would see families in there. And then I met Half Thor Bjornsson, who's like the strongest man in the world. He's like six foot nine, like 350 pounds. And he's just shoveling this stuff down to gain weight and just power lift. And I was like, this is the weirdest overlap of what I'm looking at. So I've just always followed, I've always followed my heart, I guess, in concepts that are a little against the grain. And, but concepts have found me that tend to lean like Scandinavian. I don't know why, um, but I just kind of like, I, I like all that stuff. Okay. So we'll see what, what comes next. Maybe um, horned hats. Business. Yeah, yeah. I'm bringing back the helmets. You know what? Did they ever really go away? Um, <laughs> now, since then, you've, you've gone back into acting. You went away for a while. I, I was trying, I was ragging my brain to think of another case in show business where there are identical twins who are acting, now not acting together as a team. You and your brother are now out there in the world. I'm curious, are you looking at sometimes the same scripts? Are you going up for the same parts? Like, what does that look like now? And then when you are out there auditioning, getting different roles, are you still in communication with each other about in terms of like the business side of it, of like, what do I do about this? Because you've grown up. Yeah, I mean, definitely. It's funny. We'll, we'll talk to each other and be like, hey, did you get this? Or did you get sent that? Or like, um, you know, what are you auditioning for right now? And we'll oftentimes just send each other it. Or we'll do the self-tapes with each other or auditions with each other in the case that we need it. Um, but yeah, I think part of our thing was there gets to a point where like twins, especially identical. First off, it was practical growing up because you know, a child can only work so many hours on set. But if they had the same child, you double your hours. So, like, we came into the business on a practical notion. But then you reach a certain age, and that's not necessary at all. So we haven't really worked as twins in a while. Um, also, for the fact that there's just, like, not a lot of good twin roles in general. It's, like, it's either pretty slapstick or it's, like, just very out there or there's a twin role that comes through and the actor who it's being offered to decides they want to take a chance on playing two people on a green screen so you know i think i have high hopes for us working together again but i definitely think it's going to be something that we have hands in making um and i think that that's becoming more of a reality with all that uh, we're doing in indiana um, and after now this executive production thing, we're looking a little more seriously into more projects. So we'll have to walk you back on that because I know you just did the. I know the movie was shot in Indiana. I know you just did the premiere in Indiana. But tell me a little bit about how you wound up in Indiana. We wound up in Indiana, which uh, I'm so thankful we did. Um, we wound up in Indiana through a producer of ours named Zach Spicer um, over at Pegasus Pictures. Um, my writer directors of this project ended up, uh, while they were finishing and finalizing a redraft of the script, ended up uh, during COVID camping on a tent on his land as he was deciding whether or not to, to put some money into the project um, and finishing the script. And then by the end of their camping excursion told them, okay, few caveats, you got the money, but we're also going to need to do this in Indiana, where he has shot plenty of times with his partner, Gordon Strain. And, uh, and we were trying to make Indiana look like Venice Beach and uh, Mexico at one point. Um, but I will say this. I don't think we could have made that movie anywhere else. And for what we had and what we did, 
I'm so glad we shot in Indiana because we just had our premiere there not even two days ago. And the amount of support and hospitality we've received from that state was unlike anything I've ever seen, truly. We had about 1,600 people show up to the premiere. Um, we had our uh, after party at their beautiful museum, Newfields. Um, and the support that we felt, people are so fiercely loyal and loving of their own state there that they were so excited to see what we made. And so that was a very exciting experience and I wanna, I wanna make more there for sure. Indiana, Indianapolis can be the new Atlanta maybe. That's what we're hoping. I love it. Um, I wanna ask you about your, a little something about your last film. I'm gonna be honest, I'm a little embarrassed to ask you this, but I know you had a, you had a butt double on your last <laughs> movie. I'm, I'm sorry, I feel so weird asking you about this, but you had a butt double and I understand that you get to choose, like this is one of the perks of being the star of a movie. That yeah. They don't just assign you. A butt double. So what is the process? To walk me through what the process is like when you're looking at butts and saying... I'll tell you, see... I'll take that one. This was... Um, how vulgar am I allowed to get on this show? Um, Knock yourself out, pal. Um, I did not know I had a butt double before going in. This was just contract... There's been a few really good things in the industry that have evolved over the last, you know, 10 years. I feel so old saying that. Um, but... Obviously, intimacy coordinators are part of that, which I think is a great change in the industry. Um, but a lot of just stuff that I wouldn't have presumed would be written in the contract, bar none, um, is just included in. And one of those things was a butt double, right? So by the time we were getting close to shooting this scene, which was, pardon my French, but just an insertion shot, kind of shot from behind, they were like, hey, do you want to, uh, a few days before, they were like, hey, do you, want to, um, do you want to use your butt double for this one? And I was like, what? What are you talking about? And they were like, yeah, well, you, you have a butt double. And I was like, I did not know that. They were like, yeah, come over here. Let's show you the list. Um, and it's literally just shots of guys with their asses. And they're like, choose which one that you want. And it was like 10. And I was like, I don't know, <laughs> I don't know. And so I actually, I asked for help. I asked my co-star of Virginia and I, and I asked a few other people. I was like, hey, look, if you're comfortable, would you help me pick a butt? Cause I don't know, I don't know what a good butt on a guy looks like. Do you ask your wife? Do you say which one looks most like mine? I did send it to my wife. Um, I didn't ask which one looks like mine. I was like, maybe that's not, not what they want. Um, and unanimously around the board, <laughs> Everyone chose the fattest donkey, like the bubbliest butt possible. And I <laughs> did not expect that. I did not see that coming. I didn't know that that was a desirable trait on a guy. I didn't know like a big round bubble butt was a desirable trait. Um, so, you're, so your character is really caked up. I'm caked up. <laughs> I am caked up in this. Now. I want to tell you the vulgar part of the story. Oh, that's okay. the vulgar part. That's okay. not even the vulgar part. Okay. Now, they asked me ahead of time. They said, hey, look, you know, you picked your butt double. Um, how's about this? We're going to shoot this quick scene. Ten seconds of a scene, right? It's just a pull-in, okay? It's supposed to be erotic, romantic, just a pull-in scene. Why don't we do like a, we shoot the rehearsal with the butt double first and then if you feel comfortable, you jump in. We'll keep you in Video Village. It's a closed set. Everything's going to be okay. I say, okay, I'll, I'll write. That's fine. So I'm standing in Video Village and they're, they call action. It's the butt double and it's Virginia Gardner who was a brilliant actress and she, she's lying on the scene. And they call action and she goes to pull in the butt double. But the thing is, when you're pulling in someone, you want to pull in straight, right? But she pulled in like this. Now, <laughs> I swear I saw out this man's mouth. I, I, that was the coldest air he probably ever felt in his life. And I, I told my producer, I looked at my producers and I said, I think we'll just continue using the butt double for this scene. Um, I think I'm good. Yeah. So what you see is what you get in that. It's not my butt. Sorry, guys. It's, it's not your butt, and it's not, it's not what's 
around and in the butt. Okay, good to, good to know. All right, on that note, I'm going to ask you one more question. Um, <laughs> yeah, say, we I'm, probably got to end up that. I got to. I got to change the subject so quickly now. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to pivot like you would not believe. So you, um, I know you've said um, how there aren't a lot of great roles for twins because they usually get snapped up by some actor who wants to stretch their wings. Yeah. I want to know, who do you think? What is a good twin performance by a single actor that you've seen? There are a lot of them. I mean, the last one that comes to mind is Tom Hardy in that movie. I'm forgetting the name of the movie. I remember my brother, he was like, comes up to me. This is such a, this is such a specific complaint. But he's like, dude, another, another movie where a single actor takes job away from identical twins. I was like, Cole, I don't think those producers were even looking in the direction of us if they're hiring Tom Hardy. <laughs> it's like, we're very different people. You were not going to play English gangsters in no, the 1950s. No, I don't think that works the same with us. Okay, probably. So, You're probably not up for the same part that like Dove Cameron would be. No, okay, no, I, you know what I mean? I so. do, okay, probably. Um, Dylan, thank, thank you, thank every part of you for your, for your fine work. <laughs> the movie, once again, it's called The Duel. Thank you, Dylan. It's out us. tomorrow. I don't know when this airs, but it's out Wednesday, uh, the 31st. And we're in theaters for one night only. I hope that everyone can go see it. Go see it. Thank you for watching Salon Talks. If you had a good time, why not subscribe right over here so you can get more conversations with your favorite artists, actors, directors, writers, comedians, musicians, politicians, everybody you love and I love too. And while you're here, why not watch another video right now?